the topic for tonight is can foreign aid really help Africa? Uh, this is a conversation that uh, is meant in the broadest sense of, of foreign aid. Uh, we're interested not only in you know, US foreign aid, but more globally, what can we do as individuals and as communities to try to address some of the issues that we know are out there in the world and particularly in Africa, things like human security, global hunger, poverty, um, health issues, uh, women right, women's rights and gender equality, education. What is it that uh, we can do? What are we responsible to do? And, and what are the ways in which we can do it? And we have two um, uh, people here who are um, really experts as, at, at addressing and answering those um, questions. Um, first, we have um, Ruth Messenger. Ruth is the president of the um, American Jewish World Service. I, um, uh, Ruth and I go, go way back, and it's such an honor to uh, welcome her here. My first memories of, uh, of Ruth are as a small, I don't know, must have been 10 or 11 year old, and I remember on certain holidays in our synagogue, which Ruth also attended, uh, a New York synagogue called the Society for the Advancement of Judaism, we would dance around on Purim, and I always remember up in the front left where I would recognize Ruth, and um, I knew that she was somebody who was uh, very important. She was borough president of Manhattan at the time, and sort of the first celebrity that I knew, and I was always look up and say, wow, there's our borough president. I don't think I quite knew what borough president was, but I did know that it was somebody whose picture was in the paper, and most other people I knew, their picture never made the New York Times. So um, uh, after uh, leaving uh, uh, her politics, um, including a run for mayor of, of New York City, um, Ruth went on to become the president of the uh, AJWS, the American Jewish World Service, which, as she'll tell you in a few minutes, is a faith-based international human rights organization that works, that works to alleviate poverty, hunger, and disease in the developing world. Um, they do uh, really incredible work, and I will let Ruth tell you more about that in a moment. Our other speaker tonight is uh, Dan Chereau. Uh, Dan is the uh, Tamaki Professor of International Studies at the Jackson School of International uh, Studies. Um, Dan is a sociologist um, by training and has published um, dozens of books and articles on a variety of, of topics. Uh, most recently, he's written a lot about ethnic conflict. Um, his most recent book is Why Not Kill Them All? The Logic and Prevention of Mass Political Murder. Um, in addition, Dan has uh, spent a tremendous amount in, of time in Africa. He just got back from Africa on Saturday, in fact, um, uh, doing consulting work for a variety of uh, international um, uh, organizations, uh, the UN and CARE, I believe, are organizations that he has, has worked with. So I'm going to um, kick it off and uh, ask Dan to give us a little bit of a background on some of the um, uh, general issues about aid and, and how it um, impacts um, uh, Africa. And then we are going to. Um, let Ruth tell us a little bit about the things that she does, and uh, we'll take the conversation from there. So, Dan. I don't, know if my, I don't know if my microphone is working. It's working? Okay, good. So uh, I first went to Africa in 1964. Um, after college, I joined the Peace Corps, and I went to the Republic of Niger, which was a very poor country, uh, very large in area, but not very large in population. Uh, and I worked there from 64 to 66. I, much later, in the year 2000, I went back there to do some work for CARE, which is a foreign aid organization, uh, a, a nonprofit uh, that mostly works with contracts from the United States government, but some other contracts too, and some private donations. And like many people who work in Africa when they were young back in the 60s or 70s and then went back later, I was shocked because it, the situation was worse. The country had gone from, and, and it's not, of course, the only country like this, but it's, it's, it's the one I know really well. Uh, the population had gone from about three and a half million to about 13, 14 million. Uh, the capital city, which had 40 to 50,000 people when I was there, had, had now over a million people. Uh, and the standard of living, the average standard of living, was actually lower. And you could tell people were poor. Uh, and, and a lot of the infrastructure that had been there had broken down. Some new stuff had been built. Whatever had been built had been done uh, with foreign aid. Uh, but a lot of stuff had broken down and was no longer working. And it, and it was very disillusioning to see so many projects, so much foreign aid compared to the size of the country that had been put in there, that had just gone to waste. 
And you can go to many countries in Africa and find some of the same things. Of course, there's been progress in some respects. For example, vaccinations. Uh, measles used to be a really big killer in Niger and elsewhere in Africa. Uh, and there's a vaccine against measles now, and so far fewer kids die of measles. Uh, general health care is better because when levels are very low, just some vaccination projects and a few basic projects can actually improve things. But generally, throughout the entire continent in sub-Saharan Africa, there are very few success stories. And so the question arises, does foreign aid really help? Because even though the total amounts of foreign aid to countries like Niger or some others may look small as a proportion of their total economic output and as a proportion of their government budgets, the amounts of aid have been very large. So the question arises, well, why hasn't aid as a whole worked so well? And that leads directly to the question of what kind of aid? Uh, and what's been found over the decades is that government to government aid or aid coming from the World Bank, which has to go to governments, uh, often gets wasted. It becomes a kind of a resource for poor governments where the elites, to put it crudely, steal the money. It's not quite so simple. They don't just take it, but it amounts to about the same thing. And, and so it doesn't do much good, and it corrupts the whole political process and can even lead to some conflicts because in some countries that are really resource poor, being in the government and having access to this aid, controlling the capital, basically, the capital city, and, and controlling this aid becomes a way of supporting yourself and your family and your clan and, and your clients. And so it becomes a source of conflict and, and further corruption. So what a lot of foreign aid organizations have done is to say, well, it doesn't work to give money for big projects to, to governments. Uh, on the other hand, if you go to just small projects, you can do quite a lot of good, but it's very localized. And so does that help the whole situation? And th th those are really the basic questions to ask about foreign aid. Uh, some of it has worked. A lot of it has not worked. Some of it has corrupted governments. Some of it may have done more harm than good. Some particular projects have been astoundingly successful, but usually at a local level. Um, and just to finish my remarks, in these last few years, there's been a lot of talk about how finally Sub-Saharan Africa is doing better. And a lot of that is because the um, economic fortunes of a lot of these countries depend on the price of the commodities to export. Some have very few commodities and they're not benefiting. Others, the price of oil is up, the price of most minerals is up. And so things look good, but that's happened before. And then prices drop, and they go back to the situation they were in before. And can this change? Will it change? Those are the big questions. Um, OK, so um, first of all, it's um, thank you, Noam. And it's a great structure for these discussions. And I've met some of you in the audience. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm in awe of actually speaking to somebody who who is an academic who studies these issues all of the time, because um, I just get to go out there and talk about what we're doing and give my points of view on aid, which fortunately, I'm happy to say, are not so different than Dan's. But he's got a wealth of knowledge and experience to bring to the issue. That said, I'd like to s step back. And you'll, 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 I'd like to talk first a little bit about what American Jewish World Service does, because we do provide a particular type of aid. We are a serious grant-making organization, but we fit into that niche that Dan just referenced, in which we don't pretend, we don't deal with governments. We don't pretend to be solving major problems for countries or even for regions. We take the position, which I'll try to defend a little more as I speak, that the best way to make change is to look for small places where there are people who have created their own organizations. And I'm not talking about anything formal. I'm talking about people who have, sometimes it's more formal, but very often it's just people who have come together, have their own vision 
of something they can do in their community. We call it very often their own vision of justice because we look at this from a Jewish point of view. And they can tell us what kinds of things they would do with relatively small but somewhat consistent and sustainable <coughs> grants. We make those grants. We're very serious about reporting and accountability, which, by the way, most foreign aid is not at all. Um, and uh, we help them learn, and actually we help ourselves learn, the best ongoing approaches to monitoring and evaluation of what kind of benefit those dollars are doing. It's incredibly rewarding. I invite lots of you to learn more from us, take some of our literature, or travel with us. But before I talk about all the exciting things I get to see, it is surely open, and I think Dan was suggesting this to the sort of accusation of, well, you're not solving the problems of um, Kenya. You're, you, haven't, you haven't fixed Darfur. Um, what about the problems in Uganda? And we plead guilty to that. That's not who we are. But what we can say is that comparatively small amounts of American money make dramatic changes managed by highly responsible people who have a passion for making improvements in their own community um, and use that money very well and produce significant results. Now, I love the uh, way in which Dan came at this because for sure, if I was um, talking with someone who had a raft of data and evidence that could say, well, that's fine, that's what you do with um, you know, 500 grants to small organizations around the world. We give away about $14 million a year. Um, probably, I haven't checked recently, but probably about 40% of that in Africa. And if Dan were saying, yes, but when the U.S. government does this million dollars or that $20 million, it's not like playing in this little sandbox. It's changing the world. How can you then defend what you do? I'd be up against it. But in fact, he and I have the same perspective here, which is that unfortunately, a huge portion of our tax dollars, because that is what this money is, is going to other countries in ways that don't benefit the people who live there. And I would just make two further comments, and then we'll get into some dialogue. One is that a great deal, and Dan referenced this very specifically, a great deal of the money that we're giving is government to government money that the America is giving. Um, for geopolitical reasons. And I wish there was a way to be a little bit more upfront about that. If we're giving, I, I don't, I'm not saying that I object to this. If somebody actually says, put a price tag on it, this $40 million of, Amer of American taxpayer money going to the following three governments, all of which we recognize are corrupt. Um, I'm not sure we would use quite so, so overt <laughs> language, but we're doing this because of our relationship with President so-and-so or God save me. Robert Mugabe, the leader. Anyway, but, but we're doing this because we need that relationship. In a sense, that might be, in some instances, an appropriate use of American money. We have a, we have a status in the world. We have, there's a lot of dicey things in the world. Those may be countries where we want that relationship, but that is not foreign aid, and we call it foreign aid. And then the second observation I would make, which is the one that's much more troubling because it's so directly antithetical to what we experience, and that is money that really is foreign aid. It's not just to sort of buy the respect of a country. It's going to, quote, deal with the HIV AIDS crisis or the food crisis or the so much of that money is given at the wrong time for the wrong spending purposes. And it's given with the notion that the decisions about what the poorest people in the world need, the one, two, three billion people who are below various poverty levels, that the notion of what those people need is best made in Geneva or at the United Nations or in Washington or London. And there is huge evidence on the ground, which Stan is actually happily backing me up to say, that that was the wrong guess at the wrong time in the wrong way. The money came for the wrong things. Sometimes just because we don't know nearly as much as we think we do, and we don't know as well as people on the ground, and sometimes because we are giving aid money in response to the interests of special interests in this country. So we are giving money because it's the way in which the agribusinesses can get a chunk of your and my tax dollars. We are giving money, I mean, the worst example of this, and then I'll stop, because I'd love to hear what you have to say about, about, about 
um, foreign aid. We have rang up debts for other countries all over the world of enormous proportions because when we gave money to win friends and influence people, we gave it as loans. There are countries throughout Africa, he probably knows how many, I don't, but where their annual interest on debt that was given to a dictator like Idi Amin, who's been dead for years um, or out of power, um, the interest on that debt, principal's not being paid back. So the interest will be paid forever, and the interest that's being paid is more than the health or the education budgets of those countries. Now, that just makes no sense. We are, we are buying with our tax dollars a permanently bad situation and making it worse every day, every month, every year. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> we're done. We agree with everything. <laughs> we're going home. <laughs> one, one, of the, uh, one of the key examples that you just mentioned uh, has been written about by some people. Nicholas Kristof occasionally writes, oh, he frequently writes about Africa, and sometimes he writes about this particular issue, so some of you may know about this. But particularly with food aid, uh, a lot of American food aid is actually a subsidy to American farmers and to big American farms. I mean, to, And there's a lot of criticism about it because there are countries, right now, for example, in Kenya, um, where I was last week, um, there's some areas that have famine conditions because even though right now the rains are pretty good, actually they're very good right now, in fact they're too good right now, but that's after years of drought. There's enough food, but when there's a donation of just food that comes in, it winds up getting sold cheaply, even though originally it's supposed to be given away. So American farmers get a benefit, or some Amer big American farms, farmers get a, a benefit. The food arrives, it's taken over and sold cheaply, and uh, then that hurts domestic farming because it reduces the market share that local farmers have. Uh, and all sorts of price distortions occur. Uh, and then when local farmers start producing less in response to this, then those who are selling the food that's supposed to be given out free jack up the price. And it turns out that a lot of the famine conditions that exist wind up existing because people can't afford to buy food. So the foreign aid in food has a very perverse effect. And now the preferred way of giving aid in food crises not just in Africa, but wherever they occur, is to provide money for people to buy local produce, which helps local farmers and helps develop agriculture, and at least taps what is available uh, instead of creating these perverse in incentives. So that's one example, but there are many others. I, I do want to say one thing. Um, you can really criticize American foreign aid, but other countries also give foreign aid. Some, like the Scandinavian countries or the Netherlands, tend to do a good job but some have even much more corrupted systems than the United States, for example, France. Um, and I've worked mostly in West Africa, in Francophone West Africa. And I'm not, since this is not of great interest to most Americans, I'm not going to go into the details. But actually, we look pretty good <laughs> compared <laughs> to what the French have done. Uh, and there are some other cases. There are real questions in East Africa now about Chinese aid which brings up all sorts of interesting questions also. So, so we're not the worst, but really not, it's not just that some money has been wasted, because in the larger so scheme of right. things, it's not that much money. It is American taxpayer money, but it's not that much money. And most Americans, most public opinion polls indicate that Americans think that the United States is spending a huge amount in foreign aid, and actually it's, it's very little as a proportion of our total economic output. But it's not just the waste, it's that there can be some perverse effects. And so these small scale projects of the type that you engage in, even if they don't transform everything, can have better targeted, more beneficial effects. And if you have enough of them, your organization alone can't do everything. But there are lots of other organizations that are turning to this kind of approach. And that promises to definitely be more helpful than things that have happened in the past.
Yeah, I would just to pick up on the, the food aid examples. I mean, it, it, first of all, we're talking about minuscule amounts of American money. And I believe it will shock almost everyone in this audience to know that of every dollar of food aid that the United States provides, 65% goes to American shippers. So it's not even American farmers, which, which we agree are the large agribusiness multi-conglomerates. 65 cents of every dollar goes to shippers. And we are the last country in the world that is shipping food. So the European countries, some of I don't, I don't know some about the more corrupt ones, but, but um, uh, England and Canada were the last two countries shipping food, and they've stopped. Mm -hmm. So they are providing cash vouchers um, or buying food locally. The World Food Program would like to be able to buy food locally where that's possible, and they are blocked because it's a condition of the American dollars through the United Nations to the World Food Program that the bulk of the food be used, be the food that is packaged in America and sent on American shippers. Um, just one other comment. Um, Dan mentioned sort of as a quick handoff the countries that are doing this well. Um, you do need to know that we are signatories to something called the Millennium Development Goals, which mm -hmm. were adopted in the millennium in 2000, the premise of which was that in um, seven or eight major areas, maternal mortality and morbidity, infant mortality, that um, there was a plan for how those problems could be cut in half by 2015 and in many cases eliminated by 2025 if all of the countries in the world that give non-military foreign aid, which is about 23 countries, started giving 7 tenths of 1 percent. I just don't miss this. Not 7 percent. 7 tenths of 1 percent of their budget for non-military foreign aid. There are only four countries in the world that meet that ridiculously low standard. And he actually mentioned them. It's Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and the Netherlands. And the United States, have, being a signator to this in 2000, to be making progress toward that number by 2015, is giving 0.18%. So less than 2 tenths of 1% of our budget for non-military foreign aid. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd like to just tell you, the first time I ran into some corruption uh, with USAID, it's a trivial example. Oh, these are but, great stories. Good. So it's when I was in the Peace Corps, and I was working with an adult literacy program, and USAID um, provided some ballpoint pens for people to write with because, well, the whole program was misbegotten from the beginning. But anyway, the American embassy in Niger provided pens. And I was out, uh, one of the regional inspectors of this program, and these boxes of ballpoint pens came. And I opened one, and I started trying to write with it. And it was all dried up. I mean, there was, it didn't write. I opened another box, and then another box. And it was, I mentioned this because it, it was from some company in Brooklyn, in, in New York City. Um, and so I got back to the American Embassy. Uh, at the time, it was very difficult to make phone calls, so I had to wait until I was back in the capital. Um, of course, things are very different now. Everyone has cell phones, but in those days, you had to use landlines, and the landline, the landline in Niger was always down, and you would go to the local post office to make a phone call, and they'd say, well, how far away are you calling? Oh, well, that's only 400 miles. Why don't you drive there? It'll be faster. <laughs> so, so, well, uh, that's very different now because of cell phones. And there are cell phones everywhere. Anyway, I got back to the embassy and I said, look, you sent all these pens and none of them work. And <laughs> this young guy who was working there, who I'd become friends with, he was only a couple years older than me, sighed and said, I think that that's some congressman from Brooklyn and it's some company that had these pens that were old and couldn't be sold. And so we bought them and then gave them. And so he got rid of his pens, and now you have pens that don't work. And I said, well, that's all right. None of the people who are supposed to use these things know how to write anyway. So. <laughs> but that, that gave me my first insight into that. And then I have other stories, some, some of them more serious. But uh, uh, yeah, you, 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 you can 
you can find a lot of examples of things that have been done wrong. Now, some things have been done much better, so we shouldn't be too negative, but still. If I can just um, jump in, I mean, I'm an outsider to this conversation, and uh, I'm glad that it's complicated, but it's also, uh, it's a little bit, um, um, you know, to think about this question, can foreign aid really help Africa? It seems like we have, we have, two, we have two problems. The first one is our own government, which is um, contributing uh, to this problem in a lot of ways that in some ways the solutions sound rather simple, but uh, they're ones that are connected to all these intractable political issues in our own country. And the second is even if um, we were to figure out ways through grassroots organizations of actually doing people-to-people -people connections, that the, they're quite small in scale and it's not clear if those are actually scalable projects. So um, I guess maybe to, to turn the conversation a little bit toward, you know, what if you wanted to be optimistic or you wanted to sort of say, if you're interested, here are things that you can do, what are some of the things that we can be thinking about? I mean, the problems seem so deeply ingrained. It's, um, it's uh, to talk about all the issues. What, what, what should we be doing? What could we be doing? How much hope do you have that things could actually be different? Or should we just be throwing up our hands and saying, you know, this is just too deeply ingrained in our own domestic policy and in the problems um, in, in Africa? Well, there, there are some things that can be done and actually looking at your organization's website, I saw a list of some projects, so maybe you could describe some of, some of the things that you've done that uh, have been successful. And there are others who have done things like that too. Even, even someone who's now very well known, the economist Jeffrey Sachs, who used to give advice about big macroeconomic yes, things. Right. I mean, he's moved in exactly the opposite direction now in trying to finance a lot of small projects. But why don't you describe some of what you're well, I will describe a couple of them, and I want to give one or two quick um, answers to, to what you said on the most macro levels. The first one is um, uh, there's a very good organization that was started by one of my improbable heroes, Bono, who happens to have a great piece on the op-ed page today about AIDS, which I'll talk about a little later. But, but one of the um, things that Bono did with his organization, which the U.S. government could do at any point in time, is to look at the interconnections between aid, trade, and debt. Because whenever we have these discussions and debates, including if I was talking to the head of, you know, the, the, somebody from the U.S. government who was very proud of the foreign aid um, record of the, of the United States, which in some instances, I agree with Dan, has been intended to do some good, they would be talking extensively <laughs> about the aid they give. But they wouldn't be talking about the fact that at the same time we have trade policies that make it impossible for some of the countries where we're pouring in foreign aid to actually sell what they make. Uh, I came back from uh, seeing our projects about eight months ago in Ethiopia, and if my backpack had held had any more space, I could have opened up a store in Ethiopian cotton, which is extraordinary and which makes wonderful gifts and which clearly could be an enterprise for Ethiopia, except we make it impossible for them to afford to bring the so, so the connections between aid, trade, and debt, and that, makes, that brings me just to the second large-scale thing. The United States is in a position both directly in terms of bilateral debt and hugely influentially in terms of multilateral debt, world, um, world monetary, the Mon Mon International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, to start canceling debt. We have such a program adopted in the Bush administration but if you read the conditions and look at the progress, we'll, we will all be dead, even people much younger than me, before we get to any, the only country whose debt we've forgiven under that program so far, I think, is Madagascar, <laughs> which is not a country that was just dying out of these problems. <laughs> but in Haiti, on the day of the earthquake, although the United States had already canceled all Haitian debt to the U.S. The Obama administration did that when it came into office. On the day of the earthquake, Haiti owed $1.3 billion to world institutions, and Haiti as a country had been in debt since the day of its founding because mm -hmm. the French required reparations for the loss of their slaves. Mm -hmm. So Haiti had been in debt from 1804 to 2011, and that debt is now down to $200 million. And none of that was, that's all at the result of good things the United States government has done when it wasn't entirely in their control. We went to the International Inter-American Inter Development Bank and the World Bank and the IMF and just got everybody to cancel debt. So it, it, may, not it may not feel great right now in Haiti where the situation is still, but Haiti will, by the end of this year, have no debt for the first time in its 210-year history. 
So those are things that could happen in several of these countries in Africa mm -hmm. immediately. Um, and we could do it with conditions. So the condition could be, if you invest this money, I think it was Tanzania, but I'm not sure, where we forgave some debt on the condition that, here's a good example of confusion. We forgave some debt in some African country, I think Tanzania, about three years ago, on the condition that the saved money that was no longer paying interest to the US be used to eliminate school fees. A very legitimate condition, costs money to go to school even when they say it's free. That was the good news. The better news, sort of, was that a million children showed up to go to school. The bad news is there are no salaries for teachers. There are no salaries. There's no space. So even though you can educate in most of these parts of the world, you, can, you don't need classrooms. You can educate outside. But there, there's, no, there's no school. There's no money for teachers. So mm -hmm. I just want to say, so, the, so I appreciate your op invitation to, for me to talk about our work. But I can't answer your question, Noam, which is how much of our work is scalable. Our work depends on really finding the right leaders. So some of it, as Dan noticed on the website, has gotten very big. I mean, we work with uh, several agricultural sustainability projects around the world, some in Haiti, by the way, several in Kenya, some in Ethiopia, um, where over the course of a decade of really small dollar amounts, they have set up what used to be called, they probably still are called in the United States, farm extension programs, training people, setting up model farms, which, by the way, I want to say 15, since this is the Jewish Studies program, 15 years ago, not 15 years ago, 30 years ago, the best provider of model farms in Africa was Israel. And when you talk, when you go to communities, a lot of places where we work, people think of never met a Jew. But if they have a connection to the world Jewish, in much of rural Africa, it's, you know, there used to be an Israeli farm here. Could, could you get the Israelis to come back and do that again? So, you know, that was good aid. Of course, what was being done, no secrets, everybody here gets it, for geopolitical reasons. And unfortunately, Israel stopped because they didn't like the geopolitical results they were getting. But meanwhile, there's still people in Africa who remember that the Israelis helped them make their deserts bloom, helped them grow trees. And none of that is, I've been in the site of the, where the Israeli model farm was in Senegal, and it's gone to seed. But the Senegalese farmers remember what they went there to learn. So certainly, agricultural sustainability, we are, as you gathered from what I said before, really food only in the most severe emergencies. We are rather preferencing helping farm organizations learn drip irrigation, which Israel is still teaching, um, set up collaboratives where they share seeds and um, uh, harvest the best seeds from their own best growing crops and share those where they set up a model farm. I, I have learned more about agriculture in my 10 years at AJWS than I ever thought I would. I could teach you all kinds of things that I never thought I would need to know. But how do you grow food with, without, um, without pesticides? And, and they're doing that just with the models that, that you would imagine. They bring in over a year, over a year um, 10,000 farmers show them their model farm, teach them what they're doing, give them instructions. Sometimes the instructions are, um, going back to the Brooklyn ballpoint pens, <laughs> sometimes the instructions are pictographs, essentially. This is how you build a compost heap that will work, and this is how you use it. And the, those individuals are going out and teaching other farmers. So the, one of the projects we support in Kenya, where there is severe and regular drought, um, estimates that in the last decade, they've reached 100,000 farmers at the munificent cost of $3.50 a farmer. So lot, lots of examples like that. Um, just to go back to your questions, I would like to say a little bit later about, about AIDS, because I think that's another example where, well, I mean, I'll do it right now. Today is World AIDS Day. I've been dealing with HIV AIDS for exactly 30 years, since the first World AIDS Day in 1981, before it was called AIDS. So many of you have shared this experience with me. I lived through an era in New York in which I lo lost large numbers of friends, in which the obituary pages of the Times regularly had people dying in their 30s or 40s. There are lots of people in America who are HIV positive. You know some of them. You don't know others. But by and large, they're no longer dying. The medical and scientific community has not been able to do what they thought they would do, 
which is to find a vaccine or a cure, but they have found a comparatively non-toxic regimen of antiretroviral drugs which keep, are keeping tens of thousands of people alive. There are 15 million people of the population in the world who are HIV positive who need those drugs. And with huge efforts, most of them good, so this is a good thing, in the last four or five years the world, led by America, has gotten six million of those 15 million people on that um, drug regimen. What's the matter with us? That's condemning nine million people to death. I mean, I'm sorry to talk about it that way, but the money, obviously money is, lots of demands on money, but the cost of doing this and doing it well is not astronomical. The bad news this week was that the Global Health Fund suddenly announced it was going to make no new HIV AIDS grants they're for broke. the next two years because they're broke. And the good news is that today, Barack Obama stood with Bill Clinton and George Bush and doubled the amount of United States money in PEPFAR, which is the AIDS program. And so then the question only becomes, and goes back to this, is like, don't do it badly. Mm -hmm. Badly is don't just give it to an overworked Ministry of Health. Find out where, country by country, we really can do this. Where do people get their T cells measured? How do they know when they need to take these drugs? Critical issue in the developing world. You cannot take these drugs without food. They are toxic, they make you feel terrible, and guess what, people who are taking, who are sick already and are taking a drug that makes them sicker stop taking it, which is very dangerous for us because it creates drug-resistant strands of the disease that then bounce all over the world. So we can do it, we can do more of it, but we have to be sure we're doing it right. Uh, I should add, in case you don't know, that actually Seattle has been one of the centers uh, for uh, developing ways of combating HIV AIDS. Uh, the, uh, the, healthcare, the Health Services Center and Medical School at the University of Washington have been some of the foremost places. And actually, I the Gates Foundation, I guess everyone knows that, that has know. been uh, uh, instrumental in uh, providing some funding for this. So. Um, so this, you're actually in one of the places that has contributed a lot. <laughs> Good. So we have um, a few more minutes before I want to open it up um, to questions. And I, I'm interested in, in hearing a little bit um, uh, from Ruth and, and possibly, you know, Dan, if please chime in as well, um, what, it, what it means to be a, a Jewish organization in, in, in doing the work that you do. In what ways do you feel that um, your work is informed by, by Jewish values? Why is it important for uh, your work to be framed that way and not be working for uh, another kind of an organization that's not necessarily a faith-based um, or an ethnic uh, community. What, 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 what does it mean to you when you say that you're a Jewish organization? Um, we are, um, we, we describe ourselves as a faith-based organization um, working in the Global South to support those grassroots groups that are expanding human rights and may, pursuing the de development of civil society, and which is perhaps different from some other very good organization, we work with the Jewish community in North America, or the Jewish communities in North America, to develop that sense of global citizenship that you talked about in your opening, and to tell people what are the policy issues that we could work on here that would make a difference for literally billions of people. So in a sense, that's another answer to your question. Part of, part of what's not scalable um, that I do trying to, to work with, with unsustainable agriculture, if I could get everybody here to take the petition and sign it for a Jewish position on the farm bill and help us work over the next year for a requirement for local procurement, which is that to the maximum extent possible, when there's a real disaster and food is needed, we would be looking to do what Dan talked about, cash vouchers um, and buying food locally. That would make a difference, much bigger than what I can ever do by supporting one group after another. So partly we're, we're a Jewish group that's committed to developing a sense of global responsibility in the Jewish community. I believe that the work we do is hugely informed by Jewish values and Jewish teachings, some of them very well known, um, you know, pursuing justice, which is, I think, intentionally written, um, you know, by the, by the 
ancient sages and, and in the Torah as pursuing justice, not giving service, not putting band-aids, but pursuing justice. That means looking for significant social change. Um, and the last one I just would say that, that a Jewish value that matters to me, I talked about this question of where the best solutions are found. And I really do think that a huge amount of not just American, but I liked your point, French uh, international aid is, is in fact being designed and promoted not only by people who are responsive to special interests, but by people who really think they know better than anybody else. And I think the Jewish teaching that everyone is equally made in the image of God means you should actually ask the farmers, the women farmers in northern Pakistan, what would make the most difference. That you should ask the people in Haiti what they want, and by the way, if you do that, they will all tell you, we don't want shelter, we don't want food, we just want work. Nothing that America is doing in Haiti right now is designed to give people a job. It's, it's, um, it's interesting if you think about some of the problems that you talked about in the first part of the conversation, has a lot to do with our own particular domestic concerns as Americans, uh, really undermines our attempt to help others around the world because we're very concerned about our ballpoint pens being produced. We're, we're concerned story. about our, um, our ships and our, our food being, our uh, farmers being paid. Um, and I guess, Ruth, what you're saying is, you know, your organization, and I assume this comes out of the Jewish value, is, is challenging us to look a little bit beyond our particular interests um, and maybe to look towards universal concerns. And um, uh, I guess I, I would, it would be interesting to have a conversation about, you know, the Jewish tradition certainly has, has these universal ideas, but also a lot of particular uh, uh, pieces and the notion of being a, a particular group with a specific set of obligations, both to others, but also internally. And it's interesting that, um, I just wonder if that tension at all comes out in, in your own work and as you meet with different Jewish communities where, um, I guess your argument is that there's an obligation in the Jewish tradition to think outside of our own particular needs. And I could imagine, and I could probably make a, a relatively strong argument from within the tradition that yes, that's important, but it's also important to preserve our own particular needs, um, uh, both spiritual, but also physical, economic, and, and communal as well. So does that come up as a tension? Oh, it comes up all the time. And um, there are people in the Jewish community who I actually think should know text and Torah and Talmud better than I do, who misquote it to me all the time, to suggest that we are only to be about the particular. Um, I, think it's I think it's clear that we have a, a, a heritage, um, a faith heritage that talks about both, that recognizes and lives that tension between the universal and the particular. There are, and when we develop curriculum, um, we, very deliberately do not choose only the sexy phrases that say you should be doing your work globally and with others. We repeat all of the tensions. I sometimes I say that the reason Judaism has survived for 6,000 years is because we wrote down every argument. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, <laughs> but, but in fact, where we wrote them down, you have rabbis arguing with each other about is this just for Jews, is it for Jews and non-Jews, is it for non-Jews because it's for the sake of peace. Well, what does for the sake of peace mean? Is that a noble instinct, like we're going to spread peace and tolerance through the world, or does that mean like so they don't stone us? Yeah. But I think that we're part of, we're part of that mixed tension um, historically um, as a faith teaching, and since I'm something of a prag pragmatist, I think it's clear that unless we find ways to put Jewish values and Jewish teaching into people's lives in the 21st century in a way that speaks to their role as also being Americans and also being global, we will lose the connection to the, what's most powerful in Judaism. So uh, I'm going to ask, remind everybody to be wait, 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 writing wait, down I, some wait, questions. I want to ask Dan. OK, great. I was going to ask something too. But let me just make a quick reminder. <laughs> write down your questions. We'll pick them up in a minute or two. And uh, Well, Ruth, I just want to, Dan got away okay. easy on that. I mean, I, was, I, I have to be able to defend how I do this work as a faith-based organization. And but part of my answer is it's, it's how I live my Judaism. Mm -hmm. So he works for a secular university, but I'm interested in how he thinks about these connections. Well, uh, I, I have to be honest. Uh, uh, I, I don't think about that very much. No, uh, that's, that's... Because I've never worked for a faith-based organization. Uh, there are a lot of Christian groups that work in Africa and some of them do 
uh, good work, some uh, are, are there to proselytize. And that create, can create all sorts of problems, and it depends. I mean, when you say Christian, it's so many different kinds of organizations. And some have done some very harmful things, some have done some very good things. So it's, uh, there's so many different ones, and I guess this is not the place to start talking about all the different ones and all the various things they've done for good or for ill. Um, the issue of, of relationship between Africa and Jews is actually an interesting one, particularly in Muslim countries. Um, and yes, Israel was a major contributor. Uh, in fact, I learned about agriculture from a, a Jewish foreign aid. Uh, not, Carmelis, of course, or? he was Jewish, but I mean, he was from Israel, uh, uh, agricultural expert in the mid 60s who had, when he had arrived as a young man in Israel from Romania, had uh, worked in a kibbutz. And so he knew about uh, dry climate agriculture and how to do efficient irrigation. And everyone in the foreign aid community there in Niger, which was not very big, but including some UN people and so on, looked to him because he knew more about how to irrigate in the desert than anyone else. And that was just because of his Israeli experience. A lot of that connection was broken after the 67 war when relations were broken between a lot of most African countries and Israel. Um, and then since then, Israelis have come back and have contributed quite a lot. But just one other anecdote. Um, in, 2000, toward, in December of 2003, I was in Senegal and I, was, I had gone out with some fishermen, and I was on a little island off the coast, and um, I was waiting by the, at a dock. They had gone into the middle of the island, a little island, just to get some stuff. And I was just standing there um, watching the sunset, and uh, an imam, uh, a Muslim priest is not the right word, but anyway, uh, an imam came up to me, and he asked me what I was doing there. And he spoke very good French, as do a lot of people in Senegal. And uh, he said, w w what are you doing here? Where are you from? I said, well, I'm, I'm American. And he said, oh, well, why are Americans so afraid of Muslims? And I said to him, well, I'm not afraid of Muslims. He said, well, that's obvious. You're here alone, so you couldn't be very afraid of us. <laughs> and the next question he asked was, uh, why, why is America helping Israel so much? And uh, so we talked for about an hour, uh, but he was actually, of course he was an educated religious man, so he knew French and he knew, he could, he actually knew Arabic, which most Muslims in Sub-Saharan Africa don't know, but their best educated uh, religious figures have studied Arabic. So he knew Arabic, he knew French, he knew Wolof, uh, he knew Fulani, I mean, he, uh, so he, he knew what was going on, and he had a lot of interesting questions, and we discussed this for a while. Uh, but it is something that preoccupies, not just in sub-Saharan Africa, but I was asked exactly the same question in Java, in Indonesia, sitting in a village waiting for a bus, and someone came up to me and said, where are you from? I said, I'm American. He said, why is America helping Israel so much? So it is something that preoccupies people in much of the Muslim parts of the world, and particularly well-educated people who are uh, religious but also aware of what goes on in the world. Uh, so I, I just wanted to say that, not that I have any particular insight on how that is, but it is something that we should all be aware of, that this is a question which increasingly preoccupies a large part of, of um, the population and the best educated parts of the population in Muslim countries, and more so than ever because communications are so much better Back in the 60s, uh, I don't, I'm not sure questions like that would have come up in, in Muslim parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. They, was much, they were much more isolated, but not anymore. And uh, they do send people to uh, Saudi Arabia or to Egypt to study, and they come back with all sorts of information, which they then spread some information that's correct, a lot of it which is not correct. And it's an interesting question. And I think that sometimes we aren't aware of how much this 
seemingly, I mean, perhaps for the Jewish community, very important issue, but in the larger scheme of things throughout the world, shouldn't be that major, has become a major issue in such a large part of the world. Uh, I just would uh, like to invite, um, Sarah, are you gonna pick up some questions? And uh, Jess or Jen or? Uh, just, yeah, maybe send them to the end of your rows and then you bring them up. Uh, thank you, Sarah and Jess, two of our graduate students. Who are